one. Um, we have Olivier Wittenberg who will be talking around the inverse Galois problem second lecture. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. So before I begin, let me remind you that there's a, a wine and talk graduate uh, students event tonight at 6 p.m. in the dining tent. Okay. So um, let me uh, remind you what we did uh, yesterday. So I talked about the Nutter problem. Uh, which was the rationality of this variety, the quotient of an by g acting by permutation on, on, on the coordinates. And I explained that it's a stronger problem than Grunewald's problem, which is itself a stronger problem than the inverse Galois problem. And I explained that Noether's problem has a negative answer in general. I gave a counterexample, uh, which I explained through a counterexample to Grunewald's problem for a z mod 8z uh, and q. So I should just add that. Um, for cyclic groups uh, and uh, over Q, the answer to Nutter's problem is uh, by now completely understood. So this combines uh, two things. First of all, theoretical advances, in particular uh, one of the early works of Henry Klenstra, and uh, extensive computer calculations. I mean, uh, the theoretical advances tell you that uh, for a cyclic group acting on affine space over Q, uh, the Noether's problem has a positive answer if and only if some arithmetic property of some cyclotomic field holds true. But then, uh, then you need to do something more. I mean, it's it's, it's not uh, easy to check. So then there are al uh, also ingredients coming from number theory, some height estimates, and finally, uh, as I said, extensive computer calculations. So I encourage you to take a look at the notes where this is explained. Uh, so I'm not going to to talk about this today. And also in the notes. Uh, I explained that there are also counterexamples to Nutter's problem for uh, over the, the complex numbers, uh, of course, for non-abelian groups. Then, okay. So, what are we going to do today? So, okay, Nutter's problem has a negative answer in general. Remember why we were interested in a positive answer? It was in order to apply Hilbert's irreducibility theorem to the projection from a n to this quotient. If, if, the, if the base is rational, then you can find lots of points such that the fiber is irreducible, is an irreducible, uh, sorry, connected G to R, and then, then you solve the inverse Galois problem. So if it's not rational, you can't do it like this. So let's today take another point of view. Let's look for uh, a torsor to which we could apply Hilbert's irreducibility theorem, but maybe not this one. Let's take the simplest one for which the base is rational. So that's, let's look at torsos over P1, or, uh, so open subsets of P1. So um, that's the so-called regular inverse Galois problem. Which you can ask over any field for any f finite group G. Finite group. So the question is: uh, Does there exist a uh, a connected uh, G torsor over an open subset of P1? And let's uh, even ask for a bit more uh, geometrically connect connected. So does there exist a geometrically connected? A G torsor. Um, so y to x, uh, where x is an open of p1. So just to make things clearer, uh, I, uh, let me draw a picture. So this is p. This is x. Sorry, this is p1. And x is, you remove a few points from P1. And y is going to be a curve mapping to P1, uh, mapping to x, like this. Uh, so uh, the g torsor will be uh, over the, the points where there's no ramification. So you, you remove these points. And there's an action of g on, on, the, on, the, on the curve upstairs, which acts fiber-wise. And such that, uh, and, and which acts uh, simply transitively on the, on the fibers. Okay, that's why. So. Okay, so in particular, the extensions of, of function fields 
is Galois uh, with group G. Okay, and so what does geometrically connected mean? Well, it's not only a connected curve, but even if you extend the scalars from K to an algebraic closure, it remains connected. That's what it means. So if you can do this, and K is, say, Q, then you apply Hilbert's irreducibility theorem, and you immediately solve the inverse Galois problem for G uh, over Q. So it's, uh, again, a stronger version. Um, but uh, contrary to Nutter's problem, this might well always have a positive answer for all fields and all finite groups. Uh, this is probably what's hoped. At least no counterexample is known. Um, OK, and uh, what's good with this question, uh, better than with the inverse Galois problem itself, is that it has this geometric flavor which connects it to topology in a very uh, close way. And topology is much easier than number theory. So <laughs> here's the theorem which really makes the connection. Uh, so it's uh, the so-called Riemann's existence theorem. So you take x and open in P1. Uh, and, uh, so this is over the complex numbers. x in P1 over the complex numbers and open. So you remove finitely many points. Then you can look at uh, the uh, curves covering x, which are finite et al. Um, so all the morphisms, pi from y to x, finite et al morphisms. So here I'm not requiring that these have, have an action of g and so on. So uh, in this situation, so really the picture is this. And finite et al means there's no ramification. So, I mean, it extends to some, some curve which maps to P1 with some ramification, but over x, there's no ramification. OK, so when you have this, you can look at the complex points. So it's a topological space. And you get um, a topological covering. So uh, the finite topological coverings. of the complex points of x. Okay, and the way you do this, again, is start from this, and you just look at the complex points of y. So remember, a topological covering is a topological space mapping to x of c. And locally on the base, it's a trivial. It's a product. Um, and finite means that the fibers are finite. Okay, so you have this thing, and the theorem is this is an equivalence of categories. In other words, you have a dictionary between this uh, algebraic world, world here and this purely topological world. And that's very useful. So this has two consequences. So corollary. So first, well, let's take uh, a connected G torsor over x. So here, again, x is an open in P1 of the complex numbers. So let's take a connected uh, G torsor. <coughs> then, so okay, we have a connected G torsor. G uh, is just the group of automorphisms of Y over X. Um, 
what this dictionary tells us is that we can compute this group of automorphism in the pure in the purely topological setting. It's also just the group of automorphism of the topological covering. So that's what topologists call uh, deck transformations. So this is a very nice consequence because it tells you if you want to compute uh, this uh, Galois group, you just have to, have to compute uh, some, some something purely topological. And the second consequence is that uh, if you want to construct a finite etal covering of, uh, of X, an algebraic curve like this, it's enough to construct a finite topological covering. And then you get an algebraic structure on the top, on the top space uh, for free. Uh, so uh, we are interested in uh, G torsos, so let me uh, state it for G torsos. Uh, sorry, I, I will go there. So two. So from this dictionary, you, you deduce that uh, a connected G torsor over x is the same thing as, so as what? So what is a connected G torsor? Uh, well, it's a finite etal uh, cover like this, uh, which is connected and which in addition has, uh, so connected means it's not a disjoint union of two such things. And in addition, there's an action of G on it, which is simply transitive on the fibers. Well, the dictionary tells you it's the same thing as uh, a finite topological covering, which is connected, it's not a disjoint union of two things, with an action of G, which is simply transitive on the fibers. Um, okay, but this is something we understand from topology. Uh, when you have a, a nice topological space like this, um, there's this notion of a universal covering. You fix a base point, you have the universal cover, and this is, uh, I mean, there's a Galois theory of topological uh, coverings. So the universal cover the, uh, has a group of automorphisms, which is the fundamental group of the base. And uh, all uh, connected covers uh, are uh, uh, factors through it. S uh, sorry, it uh, I mean, I, are, are subcovers of this. It's just the same thing as in uh, Galois theory for fields. And so there's a notion of Galois finite topological coverings. So that's a connected topological covering whose group of automorphism is big enough, is equal to the degree of, of the covering. And um, so you can realize them always as uh, intermediate covers of the universal covering. So that means you can realize the, the group as, uh, uh, as a um, quotient of the fundamental group. So I'm sorry, I'm going a bit fast, but this is pure topology. It's written in all topological textbooks, and it, it tells you that by, did by this dictionary, what you get is exactly um, the surjections from the, topology, the, the fundamental group of the base. So you, you pick a base point, small x, to g, um, up to conjugation by g, by, by an element of g. So again, uh, let me just draw what, what I just said. You have this space and there's this universal covering. Here the automorphism group is pi 1. And if you have your uh, uh, connected G torsor here, it will correspond to a sub-covering. Okay. So you get G as a quotient of pi 1. But you have to choose a way to factor it, and that's why you get only this up to conjugation. OK, but now this is very nice, because the fundamental group is, uh, is very simple. We're looking at an open in P1. So 
So um, let's say x is p1 minus uh, some points, which I call b1 to br. So here they would be the, the ramification, the branch points here, under the ramification points, b1, b, br, and so on. Well, everyone knows that uh, the fundamental group of this, uh, uh, if you take the complex points, that the, the sphere minus r points This is a free group on R minus one generators. And to be a bit more uh, canonical, this really has a presentation with uh, R generators, gamma one to gamma R, and one relation. The product of them is one. So let me draw another picture. So here's uh, okay. Here's the, the 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 complex plane, and there's a point at infinity. We have the points uh, b1, b2, br, and we have our base point, which we have fixed x. So the gamma i's are the loops based at x, which go around each uh, bi like this. Okay. So these are generators, and it's clear that on the picture that the composition is tri uh, is trivial. Uh, you, we're in the sphere. There's a point at infinity. Okay. So now let's plug this in, in, into that. Uh, so a, a morphism like this is the same as giving the images of the gamma eyes. So that's the same as uh, giving. Uh, a, a, a tuple of elements G1, GR in, in G. Such that the product is 1. And such that the GIs generate the group, because I want this to be on 2. Okay, up to conjugation. Ah, generate G. Sorry, up to conjugation. So conjugation. Uh, sorry. So this is in G R. Okay. So you have R elements of G, and G acts by conjugation, uh, by simultaneous uh, conjugation on all of the uh, components. Right. So this is something very explicit. So in particular. Uh, this gives a direct answer to the regular inverse Galois problem over the complex numbers. So the thing is, this uh, set is non-empty if R is large enough, that's obvious. And so by this dictionary, we, we do get a connected G, G, G cover, so G torso uh, over X uh, if R is large enough. So, uh, yeah, corollary, uh, positive answer to the regular inverse Galois problem over C for any G. So again, the thing is, you pick R large enough. This gives you, um, you, you, you choose the GIs. This gives you a topological covering. And by Riemann, you can algebraize, uh, algebraize it and, and get your cover. OK. Um, this dictionary is, is, is useful also for um, non-Galois cover. So let me uh, mention something a bit, a bit more precise. So let's pick. A finite et al cover like this. Again, x is my open in P1 over C. Um, and let's assume y is connected.
Okay, then, uh, so from topology, we, uh, we know that um, we get uh, a, a topological covering by looking at the complex points, but more than that, we get a, a monodromy action. So the, the fundamental group of the base acts on a fiber. So let's pick x. So pi 1 of the base acts on the fiber, pi 1 of x. So if you number the, the I mean, so sorry. Yeah. So this is, uh, I mean, this is the monodromy action. So if you, uh, if, if this is x, this is the fiber. You st you start with a loop based at x, and you lift it, uh, starting from one point. This will give you a path leading to another point. So let's number the ele the elements of the fiber, and w we get uh, a map to the symmetric group. Uh, S n, say n is the cardinality of the fiber, and um, so what we know from topology is that uh, uh, if you take uh, so this is maybe not Galois, but you can take a Galois closure, and then the automorphism group of the Galois closure is the image of this monodromy map. So uh, this okay, the, the image. So G, uh, G, uh, Galois group of of uh, of a Galois closure. Let me say uh, of the extension of function fields. Right. So, sorry. Th what the corollary says is introduce G, the Galois group of a Galois closure of, the, of this fu function field extension, then you can view it in a topological way, namely, it's the image of this uh, monodromy map. So it's a certain quotient of the fundamental group of the base. And it's uh, actually even better than that. You can describe the, uh, in, uh, the, um, what the gamma i's here do as permutations of the fiber. So namely, um, uh, so, um, yeah, uh, gamma i acts, so, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the gamma i acts on uh, the fiber as a product of cycles, and the uh, lengths of the cycles are given by the uh, ramification indices uh, uh, above b i. as a product of cycles uh, whose lengths have the ramification indices above uh, bi. Okay, so here, what do I mean exactly? So we started with something which is only over x, a finite et al uh, curve over x. x, well, there's nothing above bi. So there's a way to compactify y to a curve mapping to p1. So we have this picture, y to x. We can compactify it. There's a unique smooth projective curve containing y as an open subset, and it maps to p1. And now, this is not uh, unramified anymore. So here you have ramification above bi, and, and that's what I mean here. OK, so the first part is really just uh, um, a translation using the dictionary. And here, uh, to know that gamma i acts in this way, it's a purely local computation. You just have to know, uh, I mean, how a um, ramified morphism of curves looks like locally. Uh, on the complex points. So, uh, I mean, okay, this is a st standard thing. And this is very useful in practice. It allows you to compute um, uh, the. Uh, um, 
it allows you to compute the uh, Galois group of a Galois closure when you, you when you give yourself a, a cover of curves like this. So, for example, so uh, let me not enter into any detail here, but for example, if you have uh, a curve which covers uh, P1 like this, and the ramification is as simple as it can be, that is. Um, of course, there will be some ramification, but it will only be uh, in ramification index 2. And you don't have two ramification points in the same fiber. So that's really the generic situation. Then what this tells you is that if you take uh, the Galois closure, um, so that's going to be uh, another curve, which now is, is going to be uh, Galois over P1, then the group here is generated by elements. So it's a subgroup of, of the symmetric group, and it's generated by elements which act as, pro as what? As transpositions. Here it is just above any bi, one ramification point of index 2, and that's it. And then it's a standard lemma in group theory, that such a subgroup of the symmetric group, which is generated by transpositions, um, and which acts transitively on the fiber, that's the connectedness assumption, must be Sn, uh, the whole of Sn. So this uh, yields, uh, this shows that uh, the Galois closure, sorry, that G equals Sn if the ramification is uh, as simple as possible. So it, uh, it's on purpose that I'm not going into any detail here. I just want to show uh, 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 an application of this, and y you will see more in the in the exercises. Yeah. Sorry, am, am I going to separate? So, uh, so do you mean two ramification points above the same point of P1? <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, okay. So this group here is generated by the gamma i's, and each gamma i will be a transposition. So, if you get if you have two ramification points like this, you will one you will have two gamma i's, each of which will be a transposition. That, does that answer your question? Um, I'm sorry, uh, that's... <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the inverse Galois problem. So, okay, we get a positive answer over C here. Now, of course, we're interested at uh, things over Q. So the, the whole question now is how to get down from C to Q. And as far as I know, all answers to the regular inverse Galois problem over any field uh, first go through this over C, and then you try to, to descend. So there is one, one method, one technique, which is uh, at the same time very specific and incredibly effective. It's called the rigidity method. So I will, I will try to explain this now. Um, so the rigidity method So let me state the theorem. So this is due to many people uh, Belly Fried Matsat Thompson And I will state it just in the basic case. There are many variants on this, but already this basic case uh, works very well. So you fix an integer r. It's going to be the number of branch points. You fix a finite group G. Uh, and let's assume that the group has trivial center.
let's, in addition, fix uh, a collection of conjugacy classes in G, C1 to CR, conjugacy classes. Um, OK, and then the theorem says that, yes, we can realize G as a, uh, I mean, the regular inverse Galois problem has a positive answer for G over Q uh, under some assumptions on the CIs. So uh, the regular inverse Galois problem for G over Q has a positive answer. if, uh, and I'm going to state the conditions. So the conditions are at the same time a bit technical and completely elementary. If, so first of all, the each CI is uh, so-called rational, So this means that uh, for any uh, g in ci and any integer n prime to the order of g, if you look at g to the power n, it's conjugate to g in g, in capital G. G and GN are conjugate. In G. Yeah. Okay, and the second condition is that the collection C1 to CR is so called rigid. And this means the following. Um, oh. So you, you, you see this uh, set here. I'm going to almost rewrite it. Uh, and I'm going to assume in addition that each GI belongs to the conjugacy class CI. So you look at the um, the tuples G1, GR. So each GI is in CI. And I assume that the product is 1 at the and that they generate the group. OK, and the condition is that if I look at this modulo, the action of G by conjugation, I get uh, just as one element. So in other words, if I don't quotient, I, I'm going to say G acts transitively on this set. G acts uh, by simultaneous conjugation transitively on Uh, on this set, which uh, and so I'm assuming that the set is non-empty. So on this set, which 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 is non-empty. Okay, that's part of the assumption. Okay. So as I said, it's a very down-to-earth uh, statement, and um, what's maybe surprising is that it's 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 extremely useful. So there are many groups which have been shown to be uh, Galois groups over Q because we could apply this theorem to them. So in particular, the assumptions are known to, to hold for uh, at least 10 of the sporadic simple groups um, exactly in this form uh, with even a very small value of R, R equals 3. Uh, so and, and for many other classes of groups. So for example, you can apply this to PSL2 of FP for infinitely many values of P. Um, and so on and so forth. So 
it's not easy to apply th this theorem. You have to be able to find these conjugacy classes satisfying uh, this, uh, these assumptions. When they exist, sometimes they don't exist. And if you try to do it, I mean, you quickly run into computational challenges. Uh, people have used computers to, to look for such things. And in fact, as soon as R uh, gets a, a bit large, I mean, even five or six, very quickly it becomes uh, uh, infeasible. Um, also, there's some serious group theory going into the verification of this. But, okay, it, it can be done. Um, and, and another thing I should say is that when this theorem applies, in principle it is possible to uh, write down explicitly an equation for, um, for uh, the, the G tensor Y that, that, that this theorem would produce. Um, so I give some references in the notes. I encourage you to look at this. And what I will try to do today is not explain how to apply this, um, but rather explain why, uh, I mean, where these conditions come from, and I mean, uh, and, and why this is true. <coughs> okay, so let's fix once and for all a group G and the integer r. So a, l let's use a terminology. So a G cover over k. So this is going to be a geometrically connected G tensor. Just a uh, shorthand, a geometrically a connected G tensor over a, an open subset of P1. Open X in P1 over K. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. Uh, a G cover over Q. Um, so it turns out that it's very useful to look at the set of all G covers. So there's a moduli space for this. Um, so let me first introduce uh, just w one thing. Uh, whenever I have such a thing, I will denote by capital B the set of branch points. So B will be uh, P1 minus X. Okay, so it turns out that there is a moduli space for these things. So that means there's a sum variety uh, whose points, over uh, whose K points, are the G covers over K, for any K. Uh, so if you fix the, the degree of B. So that's a theorem due to Fried and Fulklein. So, uh, uh, sorry, and here comes one of the assumptions. The center of G should be trivial. If the center of G is trivial, there is a variety, curly H over Q, uh, that parameterizes uh, G covers whose branch point, uh, whose branch locus has degree R. So you have R uh, branch points, uh, G, uh, G covers. Uh, with degree of B equals R. So here parameterize is, uh, is in a loose sense, but I really mean very precisely uh, that if for any field K of characteristic zero, the set of K points is the set of isomorphism classes of G covers over K with uh, R branch points. Uh, G covers over K with degree of B equals R. That's right. That's right. Yes. Thank you. So I repeat, I, I fix R, but I don't fix B. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's uh, something you have to take as a black box. I mean, uh, this thing exists. And so it's a very standard thing when you solve modular problems in general that you're never going to find such a thing 
if the, if the objects you're trying to classify have non-trivial automorphisms. Uh, and this is the meaning of this assumption here. You can check, it's easy, that the automorphisms of G cover, uh, that's the center of G. Okay, and so and moreover, sorry. So not only is there such a variety, but in addition, and there is a, a finite etal map sorry, a finite etal map from uh, this script uh, curly H to curly U, and curly U is the variety which parameterizes the Bs. Uh, that parameterizes the bees. So this is very easy to construct. It's an open in PR, actually. The bees. I mean, B is given by the zero locus of some polynomial, which is well defined up to scalars, and the coefficients of this polynomial uh, give you a point in PR. So this is an open in PR. Okay, and so th and the map is what? Well, you start with a G cover and you associate to it the underlying B. A G cover Y to X, and you send, uh, you, you map it to B. Okay, so the, the statement is this is actually finite et al. It's a very nice, topologically, it's a, a very nice uh, topological cover. So it, it, it already says a lot about the geometry of H. And okay, so now w that we have this modularized space, all we want to do is to find a rational point on H, right? That's all we want to do. So goal H of Q non-empty. Okay, to reach this goal, we need to understand the geometry a little better. And <coughs> for this, uh, we we will need to associate with the G cover not only its branch locus, but also the the classes G I. The, 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 the conjugacy classes of the GIs that we s saw earlier, the images of the gamma i's, the loops around bi. Um, uh, yeah? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, the way I'm, I'm, s I'm uh, telling the story today, they don't need to ramify. But in, in all papers, they are supposed to actually ramify. In, in all the literature on the topic, the, the, the assumption is that the, the BIs ramify. Yeah, that, that's in the literature. But today, I'm not doing this. Today, I, for simplicity, I'm not assuming that the BIs ramify. So I, exactly, that's why I said a, a G torso over an open X. So X is part of the data. Yeah, but um, it's a minor point. But thank you for the question. Um Oh, uh, this I don't know. I mean, okay, uh, if you know that uh, a certain group satisfies the assumptions of the uh, rigidity theorem, can you f get some extensions of this group which also satisfy? The assumptions. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not an expert on this. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So remember, we had this uh, associated with our G cover. We had this map surjection, up well defined up to conjugacy from the topological fundamental group, and here we have the generators gamma i, which are mapped to G i. And so we want to take this into account. The problem is this definition is purely topological. So it's never going to work in this arithmetic setting over Q. So we need to find an algebraic analog. So here I'm, I'm going to tell what it is. So uh, algebraic version of this. So there's an analogy. So Analogy. So what is gamma i? You're looking really at bi in the complex uh, situation, and you have a small disk 
uh, around bi, you remove bi and lo you look at a loop which goes around bi uh, counterclockwise. So you're looking at the fundamental group of a disk minus uh, the center, the unit disk in the complex plane, okay, with some base point. So this is, well, this is Z generated by a counterclockwise loop around zero. Okay, in the algebraic setting, the analogous thing is going to be the absolute Galois group of Q bar double parenthesis T. That's what you get when you localize at t equals zero from, from the function field of P1. And what is this Galois group? Well, this is the field of Puiseux series. Uh, so you just need to extract nth roots of t. So you get these cyclic extensions. And the Galois group, when you extract an nth root of t, is not, it's, it's cyclic, but it's not z mod nz, it's mu n. So this is what one usually calls z hat twist one which is the inverse limit of all of the mu n's. So mu n of q bar. So it's a pro, it's a pro cyclic uh, group, uh, but there's not a canonical generator as we had here. So that's why things become a bit more tricky. And so what was, uh, what was GI? GI was the image of the generator here by the map that you get from uh, pi 1 of the disk around BI minus BI to pi 1 of the whole X and then to G. Well, in the same way, um, here, um, uh <coughs> because we're looking here, our G is the Galois group of the function field extension. Oops. And the function field uh, of, of P1 maps to Q bar double parenthesis T. Well, I mean, you can localize it uh, and complete it at BI. And so um, this inclusion of fields gives you, naturally, uh, a, a morphism between the absolute Galois groups in the other direction. And that's how you get, in a canonical way, a morphism from this group to G. So really, sorry, I continue the analogy. So uh, GI. Uh, which is really a, a map from, sorry, the, con the conjugacy class of GI, which is a map from Z to um, G up to conjugacy. So this is well defined only up to conjugacy, remember. The analogy is going to be a map from Z hat of 1, a continuous map from this to G up to conjugacy. Okay, so um, so that's some something. So, so uh, some uh, some something here. Okay. So let me not be too precise with the definitions. I'm telling you this is the analogy, and so from a G cover, you naturally get at each bi uh, a homomorphism like this in a canonical way up to conjugation. So the point is that now we are going to look at things over Q. And if you look, look at things over Q, you want to keep track of Galois actions, of the action of Galois of Q bar over Q. And here we do have a non-trivial Galois action. It acts on this through the cyclotomic character. Okay, so now um, let's use this. So what we want to do now is we have this map. So sorry, I will write it here. So that's the end of the analogy. We have this map from H to U. So this parameterizes G covers and starting this parameterizes the Bs. Starting from the G cover, you associate to it the underlying B. What we want to do is to associate to it not just the B, but also the conjugacy classes of the GIs above uh, each BI. So <laughs> we're going to uh, have to consider a a variety here, which is going to parameterize this data. And, and then we will get a factorization like this. So what is V going to be? So first, uh, 
I'm telling you, we have this, this thing. This is a finite set, and there's an action of Galois of Q-bar over Q over it. So you can view it as a, the Q-bar points of some variety of dimension 0 defined over Q. There's C, a, a variety of dimension 0 over Q, uh, such that the Q-bar points of C are exactly this homomorphisms from z hat twist 1 to g up to conjugation. And I mean, this is an equality of sets with the action of Galois. Galois of q bar over q uh, equivariant. OK, so this is what parameterizes our GIs. And so V is going to parameterize the pairs consisting of a B and a map from B to C. Pairs B, so B is something of degree R in P1, and a map from B to C. And I mean this really in the same precise sense that I alluded, alluded to. So this is a variety over Q. And for any field of characteristic 0, the key points of this are uh, the uh, so zero-dimensional sub-varieties of P1 over K uh, of degree R, and maps of between varieties over K from this B to this C. So uh, in the same way that U was very easy to construct as an open in PR, V is, is easy to construct by hand, too. So let me not insist on this. So there's some V. And now, what I'm telling you is that because we did everything canonically, there is a factorization here. And so you can send uh, a G cover here, uh, uh, Y to X, to uh, so the, the pair consisting of the branch locus B, and the conjugacy classes of the GIs. Uh, so this something, I will write it as clear of GI, even though there's no GI here. But yeah, I mean, it's the thing which lives here and which is canonical. So canonic, uh, conjugacy classes of all of the GIs. Right, and so you project just by forgetting the conjugacy classes. So I'm telling you this is the geometry. And now what the rigidity method does for you uh, is the following. So let me go here. So remember, we want to construct a rational point on H. So for this, we have to construct a rational point on V first. So let's start with a rational point on U, and let's start with the simplest possible uh, rational point. We fix branch points, B1 to BR, and I will choose them to be rational points. So I choose points in rational points of P1, pairwise distinct. So then the the Capital B, which is the collection of these points, gives me a rational point of U. And now you can wonder what are the rational points of V above this one. Rational points of V above uh, this one, B. Well, they are exactly the maps from B to C. But B is just a collection of rational points. So, so they are just collections of rational points of C. So that's really uh, uh, C of Q cross, cross C of Q, R times. OK, but now what is C of Q? It's a homomorphism like this, from z hat twist 1 to g, which is 
Galois invariant, so up to conjugation, and which is Galois invariant up to conjugation. And now if you think just a little bit about it, uh, you realize that this is exactly a rational conjugacy class. So rational in the sense that I stated in the theorem, rational conjugacy classes. So where does that come from? Uh, so really the point is that uh, the Galois group acts here through the cyclotomic character. So you really want, I mean, you really want the thing to be invariant up to conjugation when you act by the cycl cyclotomic character, but on Q the cyclotomic character is surjective. So you want w w to have something which is invariant under conjugation whenever you raise to any power prime to the order of the element. I mean, this is really... Uh, Translation, so I'll, I'll leave it to you. And so, okay, we have a rational point on V, but we want a rational point on H. And that's where uh, this uh, method is really unreasonable. To construct a rational point on H, you would need to understand the geometry of H. But a priori, H could be something very complicated. What turns out is that the hypothesis of the theorem, rigidity, imply something extremely strong, namely imply that this map is in fact an isomorphism in the neighborhood of our point. And so in a sense we get the rational point on H for free. Um, so the fact... So if you fix uh, a point of V above B, so that's fixing rational conjugacy classes, um, so H to you, to V, sorry, is an isomorphism uh, locally above uh, above our point B, uh, uh, C1, Cr. If the con if the collection is rigid. And how do you see this? Well, to see if it th that it's an, uh, an isomorphism locally, remember, um, the this is a finite isomorphism. It's enough to, to, to look at the complex points and to see that on the complex points it's locally an isomorphism. But on the complex points, we understand everything very well. So remember that the fiber of on the complex points of the map from H to uh, U above B. Well, what is it? It's the set of isomorphism classes of G covers uh, o uh, over the complement of B. Um, um, and we saw, as a consequence of Riemann's existence theorem, that such things are exactly the two poles G1, GR of elements of G, uh, s which generate G, and uh, whose product is 1, up to conjugation. G1, GR in GR, such that the product is 1, and G1, GR generate G. Up to conjugation. Okay, and then we're interested in the fiber not from H to U, but from H to V. So what is the map in these terms from H to V? Well, starting from such a thing, you associate to it the conjugacy class of G1, the conjugacy class of GR. And so the fiber of H of C to V of C above uh, B, comma, C1, CR is, well, it's the subset of this where you impose in addition the condition that each di belongs to ci. Subset, uh, uh, where for any i, gi belongs to ci. 
And so you see the rigidity is exactly telling you that this fiber has cardinality 1. So uh, singleton if uh, C1, CR is rigid. So you get the local isomorphism of the complex, so also L over Q. And, and so your rational point lifts to rational point uh, of H. So that's a bit extreme. Hopefully, there should be other ways to produce rational points of H. Um, but uh, it seems very difficult to understand the geometry of H. So even such a simple question as understand understanding the irreducible components of H is difficult. And, but this is something concrete which you can understand I mean, with a computer. Because this is a finite et al covering, even over the complex numbers, this is a finite et al covering. So it's described by the action of the fundamental, fundamental group of U on a finite set, the fiber. And the fundamental group of U is completely explicit. It's a braid group. So you have this problem, you have a braid group, and you try to understand the orbits of the braid group. And uh, again, people have been doing this. Uh, but as soon as R gets large enough, it, it becomes very difficult even for modern computers. OK, I'm out of time. I'll stop here for today. Thank you for your attention.